Heavenly Father, we thank you for drawing us to this place of prayer and worship that we might experience your presence in prayer, in worship, and in fellowship. We thank you, Father, for the 35th anniversary of the Men's League Society of this great chapel. We thank you, Father, for the way in which you dwell within your church, as well as in the heart of every believer. Help us to let your spirit of grace continue to make us strong and steadfast in our relationship with you and in the resources you make available for a fruitful living. Let your Holy Spirit imbue us now as we approach the study of your word and that you may make the word a living message to our souls in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. I have not asked you to sit. I only said praise the Lord. And praise the Lord doesn't mean you should sit. Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. Let's put our hands together for the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. I'm pretty sure it's only the women that are clapping. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure, only the women. Only the women. Praise the Lord. I'm sure the men will not be happy because I said it's only the women. Okay, let's hear us, men. Let's hear us. Clap for Jesus. Amen. I know the usual attitude of men. Uh, we are the head of the house. Is that not so? Okay, let's have the women. The women now. I'm sure you, you're baffled. The women. Clap for Jesus. All together, men and women, youth and children. God bless you. Uh, you may now you may now sit. Thank you. I want to say I'm grateful to God for his sustaining grace upon our lives. And you'll agree with me that anyone who sleeps and wakes up should be grateful to God who made it possible for us for not being consumed by numerous dangers and challenges we face on a daily basis in our country. Do you agree with me? Okay, if you agree with me, say yes. Thank you. I give thanks to God for the life of the members of this chapel. We thank you most sincerely for your contributions in the propagation of the kingdom 
of God here on earth, God's goodness and mercy will continually be your portion in the name of Jesus. I want to congratulate especially the members of the Men's League of this chapel. The celebration today will not be the last for any of you in Jesus' name. You will celebrate many more years. You are not saying amen, oh. You will celebrate many more years in the land of the living in the name of Jesus. God will reward your labor of love in this chapel in the name of Jesus. God will sustain every member of the men's league and equip you the more, especially in this challenging and confronting times in our nation. I know most of you are already old, but you will permit me to say as you are advancing in age, God will renew your strength. I say God will renew your strength. Resounding health and peace of God that passes all human understanding will be your portion in the name of Jesus. Let me thank my brother, Caravan Oyelade, the chaplain of this great chapel, for inviting me to preach at this auspicious occasion of the anniversary of the Men's League Society. I really, really appreciate your good intentions. It shall be well with you in Jesus' name. The theme of my sermon, I wouldn't want to waste your time, is doubt and hindrances to chosen to bear fruit. Doubt and hindrances to chosen to bear fruit. And my text is taken from John chapter 15 verse 16b which reads you did not choose me but I choose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Brethren, the concept of fruit bearing is applicable to both plant and animal. Bearing fruit can be viewed as a natural phenomenon both in plant and in animal. And certain conditions must be met for fruit bearing to take place in any case. And the quality and the quantity of the fruits depend largely on how these conditions have been followed or adapted to. Of course, it is basic knowledge that given crop Take, for instance, an orange tree planted at different locations may not yield exactly the, the same in terms of fruits at their mature stage. While one may be productive, 
the other may yield less fruits. And you'll agree with me that the level of productivity will account for the value, importance, significance, and the degree of attention each commands from the owner or from the farmer. Fruit bearing brings a level of distinguishing element amongst fruits of the same species and also other crops. A farmer will under normal circumstances give priority to that plant or crop that is giving higher yield and will prefer it at any time to others. In the context of the theme of my sermon, chosen to bear fruits, doubts as an hindrances could mean a careful appointment done in order to have a successful yield or result in a venture undertaken for a purpose. God from creation has always desired growth and fruitfulness for all living organism. And the record of creation shows that not only did the land and sea were ordered to bring forth living creatures, God also pronounced the blessing of multiplicity on them. The mandate of fruitfulness on the plants of the field, the animals, the creatures in the sea, the birds in the air, and man is a clear indication and the manifestation of God's ultimate purpose for all creatures. And this has remained the, the mindset of God for his people in different dispensations. The 32nd president of the United States of America, Franklin D. Roosevelt, posits that the only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. The only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. It was Frank Dean Roosevelt who pronounced this. It is strategic to set forth goals to be achieved. And it is satisfying to have those goals accomplished. Doubt is an impediment to any achieving objectives. And this should therefore be dealt with if there is hope of reaching the desired goals in life and of any given organization. A careful examination 
of the goal set by Christ for his disciples which was reiterated by the church as embedded in the theme chosen to bear fruit he chose God's expectation on his children and one of the remarkable pronouncements of God on Adam at creation is be fruitful and multiply and if you look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 you'll find it there be fruitful and multiply these same blessings were pronounced on Noah and his sons after the deluge which destroyed every living thing on earth except Noah and his family with all that were in the ark according to Genesis chapter 9 verse 1. The Almighty God equally bestowed the, the blessing of multiplicity on the progenitors of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even unto their seeds. Jesus, therefore, during his earthly ministry, elucidated the means by which effective fruitfulness can be sustained. As he illustrates with a vine tree and its branches. According to John chapter 15 verses 1 to 16 God as a gardener thus everything possible to ensure that the branches of the vine are alive and fruitful as figuratively presented. Just like the actual vine tree is very important and serve different economic purpose to a farmer in the land of Israel. In the same vein, our fruitfulness is enhanced when we abide in Christ. As in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. Allow the word of God to indwell us as in John chapter 15, verses 3 and 7. Be prayerful, as in John chapter 15, verse 7. Continue in genuine love, as in John 15, verse 9. And keep God's commands, as in John chapter 15, verse 7. 10. Brethren, it is disturbing to note that in spite of the, the of these things, some branches are seen fruitless. Looking at the consequences of fruitlessness on a branch as Jesus reveals, it behoves every one of you to consciously examine those things that can constitute hindrances and ultimately incapacitate fruit bearing. Brethren, there are a number of things that can affect 
the productivity of a plant. So also, there are things that can hinder a person from achieving set objectives in life. I need to remind everyone that every, every mission in life has some forms of opposition in which when one false art becomes a stumbling block but when one surmounts it it becomes a stepping stone there are external hindrances and as well as internal hindrances and Paul the apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 11 to verses 23 to 30 enumerated a number of challenges challenges he faced in the course of his missionary work which were meant to, to hinder him but he rather turned them as tools to further propagate God's kingdom brethren I don't know whether you are aware that internal hindrances appear more devastating and destabilizing. Brethren, when you are suffering from lack of faith, inferiority complex, and fear, there is hardly anything you can achieve no matter the available resources at your disposal. All this amounts to one's doubt. One's doubt of his or her potentiality, ability, and capability. Doubt of course, is a potential stagnator. Potential stagnator. And doubt in Greek is diakrino. Diakrino, which means to be distinguished or divided in one's mind from the point in hand. That's the meaning of doubt in Greek. That credo. It is a thing of the mind. On the other hand, Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary defines doubt as a feeling of being uncertain about something or not believing, believing something. It is objectionable, objectionable thoughts, directions, and rationalization. It brings one to a state of uncertainty and hesitancy. And this indeed incapacitates someone from acting with vigor towards the set goals and objectives in life. Doubt makes you to underestimate your, pot your potentialities. The parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 28, 
teaches that no, no matter how small you are and may have doing something without doubting in yourself will yield positive results. Brothers and sisters, I see doubt as one of the greatest strategies the devil is using to hinder a Christian from achieving God's purpose for his or her life. God desires you to realize your, your full potentials in your spiritual, physical, social, economic, material, marital, and even in your career life. Failure to achieve this, of course, will be a great disappointment and the service to God which culminates into desecration of your personality. Doubt is injurious to one's personality. Lord Douglas opines that if a man harbors any sort of fear, it percolates through all his or her thinking and it damages his personality and makes him landlord, landlord to a ghost. Landlord to a ghost. That was the pronouncement of Lord Douglas. If a man harbors any sort of fear, it percolates through all his or her thinking, damages his or her personality, makes him or her the landlord to what? To a ghost. No wonder Jesus on many occasions taught on, on, on the need of not doubting especially in the area of prayers. As in Matthew chapter 21 verses 21 and 22 and Mark 11 Verses 23 and 24. Jesus, you know the story very well, rebuked Thomas, Gedimus, one of the 12 apostles, for doubting his resurrection in John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. Today, Anyone who is an inviterate skeptic is referred to a doubting Thomas. And if you read James chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, James infers that one who doubts never gets positive results. As members of the Men's League Society of this great chapel, bearing fruit will definitely bring increase and development in this chapel. And it's not only expected, but must be a worldwide venture. Men's League Society, you are to be men like Abraham who never doubted 
God's promise. Even in the face of human impossibilities. But remained optimistic as recorded in Romans chapter 4 verse 20. Men's League Society, you are called to be men like Daniel. Daniel, who was referred to as a man who dissolves doubt. As recorded in Daniel chapter 5, verse 12. Men's League Society and all members of this chapel, you are to get involved in doing something towards the realization of your individual and corporate goals. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 21 says, I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into, into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? This scripture indicates God's displeasure and disenchantment on vines that falls below expectation. But the question is, what could make a noble vine holy a right seed to turn into a degenerate and unproductive plant? Brothers and sisters, the smallest seed of faith is better than the largest fruits of doubtful, doubtful reasoning. I charge you, like Joshua of old, to be strong. And of good courage. Do not be afraid. Nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God. Is with you. Wherever you go. Let us all join. The hymn writer. John Newton. To declare in the words of this hymn, the chapel hymn book number 547. Let's be upstanding as we take the hymn, the chapel hymn book 547. Be gone, unbelief. My Savior is near. And for my relief, we surely appear by prayer. Let me wrestle, and he will perform with Christ in the vessel. I smile at the storm. We shall take the first two and five. The first two and five. Oh 
come to be my way. It's my guide. It's mine to obey. This is to provide. Must be broken, precious, firm. The word had spoken, surely be five now. Since all I meet shall work for my good. The bitter is sweet, the medicine food. The food at present will cease before long. And then, how pleasant. Brethren, let us therefore banish from our mind and sincerely set to achieve God's purpose for us. Like the disciples who were sent out two by two, as recorded in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 2, 17 to 20, we shall come back with greater testimonies in Jesus' name. God bless everyone. God bless all members of this chapel. God bless Men Christian League. Happy anniversary.